Hello and welcome. My name is Maria Fontanaza, editor of Food Safety Tech, and I will be your host for today's webinar, Food Safety and Environmental Monitoring in Food Production, sponsored by Thermo Scientific and featuring Michael Gannon, Managing Director at Orbis Lab System Services, and Russell McKenzie, Senior Consultant for Orbis Lab System Services. So I'd like to welcome everybody. We've got a lot of folks on the line today, so this promises to be a really exciting event. But before we get started, I'd like to review some housekeeping items to help you enjoy today's event. You're listening in using your computer's speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the question pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of the event. You can download the presentations from the handouts pane in the GoToWebinar control panel. And if you have problems with the audio, please try to increase your computer's volume. If you continue to have technical issues, please log out and try to reconnect. If these issues continue, contact Veronica Allen via the chat box to let her know what's happening. Once, as I mentioned, today's session will be followed by a Q&A, so we do encourage those questions to be sent into the questions pane. So now I'd like to welcome and introduce our speakers. Michael Gannon is Managing Director at Orbis Lab System Services. He is an engineer who has worked in the field of laboratory informatics for almost 30 years. Michael established Orbis Lab Systems in 1998 with the goal of providing integrated limb solutions to food, beverages, pharma, and government industries. Today, Orbis Lab Systems is established in Europe and the Americas, providing limb instrument integration reporting and data analytics services to more than 50 customers. The organization is a strategic partner with Thermo Fisher Scientific. We are also joined by Russell McKenzie, Senior Consultant for Orbis Lab System Services. Russell is a Coca-Cola alumnus with 30 years of experience in informatics solutions related to both beverage and ingredient quality. He held the position of Director of Global Lab Informatics supporting Coca-Cola's Center of Excellence Analytical Services Laboratories, which provided analytical support to the entire supply chain. After graduating from Coca-Cola, Russell joined Orbis Lab Systems as a senior consultant and has been working with global pharma industry customers. Through Orbis Lab Systems, partner of Thermo Fisher Scientific, Russell works directly with Thermo Scientific Sample Manager Lim software projects. And now I'd like to welcome our speakers and turn things over to Michael to begin. Thank you, Maria. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm speaking from uh, a sunny Dublin, Ireland today. What's it like in Atlanta, Russell? Yeah, it's, uh, it's about the same here. Um, the good news, we had rain last night, so hopefully you won't hear the birds chirping like we did yesterday, so. Good, good. Uh, anyway, welcome to today's presentation. Uh, we're, the objectives of the presentation are threefold. Firstly, we'd like to do an overview of the relevant standards for food safety. Then we will talk to you about a solution for that based on those standards. And finally, uh, uh, we'd like to share some ideas for you on the practical impl implementation of these standards. And I suppose I'm speaking from my own experience of being almost 30 years in business and pretty much all of that time, I've worked to the ISO 9000 standard for our consultancy services. I worked to 17025 in the delivery of lab systems. Uh, lately, I've been working with uh, the 22,000 standard and the 22,300 standard for uh, data security. Yeah, and I'd, I'd like to welcome everyone for taking time out to join our webinar today. Um, initially, we thought uh, there'd be like 50 or 100 people sign up, but in actual, we ended up having uh, just over 1,100 sign up. So um, 
I think we were quite surprised at that. The um, we when we looked at the demographics, about 50% of the registrants are coming from North America, and the other 50% are global from around the world. So I think this is definitely something that's um, near and dear to a lot of people. Um, this this subject. Then from the industry standpoint, it was pretty much everything from farm to fork. Um, and then in addition to that, with um, beverage, wineries, uh, as well as some universities and government agencies. So I think it's, um, oh, and, and one last thing, you know, small companies, medium sized, big, big companies. So it was quite, quite a diverse set of locations and um, industries joining us today. So hopefully there'll be something here for, for everyone as we go through the slides. Okay, just to start with, I think it's uh, very important to draw the distinction between safety and quality, although they do uh, interact with each other. When we talk of food safety, we're talking about programs that continuously monitor uh, areas that are deemed to be at risk uh, for food contamination. So it's a continuous process of monitoring, uh, review, approval, and continuous approval of your preventative measures on food safety. Quality, as we know, is largely uh, addresses testing of product by batch, uh, testing that the results are within specification, and we do find an overlap between the two areas, particularly in the uh, looking for the presence of allergens and label claim. And, and Michael, just on this slide, do you remember years ago there was that quality by design initiative? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I always I always thought it should have been more safety and quality by design, where you build that into those upstream processes. So you're not doing the testing at the end when it goes out the door to the customer that's too late. So it's, you're building all of that, both the quality and safety into those processes. Yeah. <clears throat> um, we, we put this, once we saw the number of uh, people, you know, the audience in here, we put the slide in um, to just to highlight a few things to look backwards where we've come from and then to where we're going to with the uh, you know the ISO 22005 version 5 um, then and then down the road with uh, the um, in 2022 but um, I, th I know we're talking about HACCP which is I think it was um, it came into it was mandatory in Europe around 2004 and that's when we started implementing that in our manufacturing plants. But the the one thing I wanted to say here was I was in China in 2008 working on a, a, a kind of a related project. But I get get this call late at night, and it's there's a melamine issue. We need data. We need it right now. This is serious. And fortunately, by that time, we did have our all of our systems on the single database. So it was easy to just within a few hours pull pull that data out and give it to management. There's been several other times when I was going through this, there was the acrylamide issue that came up um, a few years later. There was, we had a, a government subpoena that they wanted to see all of the micro testing that we were doing on finished products. So I think it's these things are going to come obviously things are going to come up but having that data that you can provide authorities or management that you are doing the testing and that if you do find issues that you're reacting to them or or that you're not finding any issues which is equally as important so that's a very useful perspective russell thanks Looking at the, the, the standards that we're addressing today, first, firstly HACCP, uh, and that's primarily focused on the monitoring of uh, risk uh, points for contamination and hygiene. Uh, Codex Elementarius is a wider standard. It does cover HACCP 
does it by uh, product types, but it covers more than just the, the monitoring for contamination. It covers additives, uh, pesticides, allergens. Uh, and finally, 22,000, and we're working to the 2018 standard. So this is really HACCP with the ISO 9001 wrapper around it, so that if, if your organization wants to bring food safety to board level, CEO level, and get you know, total organization buy-in, the 22,000 standard is very good in that respect. Now, it's still in its infancy. We reckon probably about less than 30,000 companies worldwide are certified to it. Uh, but having put HACCP in place, which is a legal requirement, uh, there's just some additions that need to go to that to bring it to 22,000. But it's very helpful in managing your, your prerequisite programs uh, for, for food safety and, and uh, control. And then HACCP itself is based on these seven principles. So you start with the hazard analysis, identify the critical control points. Those are the points that are at risk for contamination. Then the limits for those points, which I'll talk to shortly. Then the program itself. So like one, two, and three are really about setting up the program. The program, when it runs, is based on monitoring and then capturing corrective actions when limits are exceeded or when there's a, a contamination. Because we're looking at a, a database system for this, which we'll talk to shortly, uh, the record keeping, we can assure you of that and security around that data. Point six is very important though. When you identify a critical control point, a risk point, you've got to implement a preventive measure at that point. So it's important to, to determine before you set the program up that that measure is effective. And that is the verification process for that. So in the implementation of HACCP, with these four steps, there's the planning, and we use either the codex decision tree or fishbone diagrams to identify the sample points. Uh, we risk assess them using the GAMP methodology of probability times detectability times sever severability. And it's the severability that will determine the limits. They give you the control points, we validate the actions, and then we have our schedule of critical control points for monitoring set up on the system. Again, those three cover the setup. And then when the program's running, we've got data in a variety of forms to help you monitor uh, the program, the food safety program. And this is just a very simple example. I'd like to introduce uh, Sample Manager, of course, from Thermo Fisher. Uh, as we said in the introduction, we both work extensively with it. Uh, so this is an example of the critical control points. You'll see them in the, uh, the samples in the bottom right pane and the sample points in the top right pane. And those points are in the graphic. And we're looking at uh, uh, the contamination rates with air samples. Uh, you'll also see on the top of the diagram uh, rooms. So these are active diagrams. They can be of a plant or a room and the sample points are color coded. They can be color coded by sample point type or when they hit an exceedance, when a limit is exceeded, the sample point will change color and go to red. So the, that type of graphic is great to have in an executive dashboard for your management so they can come in and see at a glance how the plant is doing in terms of food safety. Hey, Michael. I saw an article recently regards to uh, food processing plants. Um, because of the COVID-19 issues, some manufacturers, I think in the meat um, poultry industry, were looking at bringing in robotics for some of that. And when I, when I read that, I thought, well, what you'd have to go back and revisit your HACCP plan if you had, like, obviously, robotics working in certain lines or places where you traditionally had, you know, employees or workers. Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting perspective and, and one that's uh, growing. 
Um, the sample points can be uh, logically grouped in terms of locations. So if you look at the right pane there, you'll see plant point locations and the sample points are underneath that. Again, in terms of a, a, a database system like Sample Manager, the sample point is, is the driver for many things. It's not just for collecting the, 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 the samples and recording where they've been taken from, but also to retrieve the data for graphing. And here they're grouped by location. And the location is given a grade based on the severability of a contamination. Uh, and this organization of data, the, the food safety solution here is primarily data driven. Uh, so I must stress the importance of data uh, and organizing data. And once that's done in the way I've shown you, downstream you get all the benefits of reporting and data analytics. And there's just an example of two rooms graded. You can see grade A and grade C. And there, that's how we apply the limits for air samples. Uh, and these can be, if you're in the United States, there'll be US FDA. If you're in Europe, EU limits. Uh, you can have warning limits and action limits. And depending on the grade of the room, the limits tighten. So for grade A, we have the tightest limits, as you can see. And when it's done, that's the setup done, now we're into monitoring. So I can look at the panel here, and on the left pane, I can see the schedules that are running. In the middle pane, I can see the samples that are pre-logged in, that I have to collect, and those that are actually logged in. And for those that are logged in, in the right pane, I can look at the, the samples taken and their results. So your full traceability from the program that you've set up and validated right through to the results as it's happening. And here again, we're back to the, the room monitoring. Uh, and you can see we've uh, water samples, contact plate, and air samples. We've used the color coding there. And of course, personnel are scanned. So one of the things we'll be looking at now with the COVID-19 issue is how we record maybe temperatures of personnel when they come to work each day and record that on the system. And we have that there if it's ever an issue. So uh, all these very current topics do attend to, to fit into solutions eventually. And importantly, these are active sample points you're seeing in the diagram. So you have drilled down again to see the testing results. You know, these systems are great for data and great for reporting, but I'm a true believer in making them work. Uh, I, I love to see a limb system delivering work. So here's a workhorse example, as I call it, where the system is driving the work that's done to collect the samples. So you can look by sample point on a particular day to see if there are samples due from that point, that critical control point, or you can look on the right pane on a particular day to see what samples have to be uh, taken. And of course, this can be uh, resolved down to the operators. So you can, you can schedule the collection of those samples uh, by operator on their daily calendars. And again, from a monitoring point of view, I'm just looking at the zones and the percentage compliance of air samples within limits. And you can see on a particular point or day when there's a drop, immediately again from an executive point of view i can say well why did that happen and drill down and find out some more there and of course then look at the history around a particular zone or sample point so a key part of 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 any uh, standardization or regulation is uh, recording corrective actions so we we record the corrective actions in sample manager we actually use its les now, LES is an acronym for Laboratory Execution System. And what that does is that enforces uh, the practice in the lab or in the plant if you're using it. So you have, for any kappa, for any deviation, you, or even observation, you've got a procedure that you must follow. And what the LES does is it displays that procedure, but it makes sure that you, that you follow it and it records that you follow it. And so uh, we can determine how good our capital procedures themselves have been, 
as well as analyzing the particular incidents that have occurred. And as you can see here, you've got the instructions in the top pane and specific information to record in the bottom right pane. As well as that, for every incident type, if it's an air sample, a water sample, or a spillage, uh, there is a particular sign-off that goes with the with the Kappa template that's activated, and you can have sign-off before the corrective action is applied and sign-off after the corrective action is applied. And again, I'd speak from experience myself here with the 9001 standard. The quality of what we do in consultancy is driven by these corrective actions. Yeah, I'm, <clears throat> years ago I had a boss and he would <clears throat> always tell me, start with it, begin with the end in mind, begin with the end in mind. And I think the end here, again, is that, that verification, the reporting, traceability, kind of like some of the stories, you know, I mentioned earlier that's happened to me, but it's, you really want to think about the reporting as you're building those on, upstream steps of the login, the scheduling, the test assignment. If you're thinking about reporting all the way through, when you get to this point, it makes it easier because you, you've got the data and that you can easily pull together these, these types of dashboards. Um, if, you, if you don't have the information, it's really difficult. And the idea is <clears throat> that it's within the system, it's within the lens, you're not having to go outside. You can quickly um, put together da dashboards like this one. Um, yeah, and in, in our research, uh, what we've seen in recent years is the issue of allergens uh, catching up with the is issue of foodborne pathogens in incidents and product recalls. Uh, we, we fundamentally believe in, in a best of breed integrated solution for quality. We've talked about LIMS from the point of view of HACCP, but you can also integrate to document management systems with or without the SOP enforcement that I've shown you, but also integrate to the ERP. And so an allergen, an allergen, uh, allergens require a specific management program. And again, a bit like ISO, there's more than just the, the HACCP. HACCP is at its center as far as the plant monitoring part is concerned, but we also have to manage the raw materials, the recipes, the supplier, the manufacturing process itself, recording, cleaning, and of course, critically labeling, because there's been a lot of issues with labeling. So there is a case there to integrate LIMS with ERP for allergen management. Um, and of course, you treat it as a potentially a hazardous substance. So the raw material has got to be stored in locations and it requires specific handling. And again, we tend to push the limbs to do that, to record the location of the material and use the handling procedures on the LES. But, so yeah, I'll Michael, you're just, just a quick point. You're right. Labeling is the number one issue that I see when it comes to allergens. It's um, some of the websites, um, food safety websites that I look at, it's just continuous. It's mislabeling, mislabeling, so. Yeah. So moving back to the to the laboratory for a, for a while, um, the key standard there is ISO 7025. And for me, that goes to the heart and center of any LIMS implementation. I fundamentally believe that you should embrace the standard as part of your implementation plan from the start. Now, those of you that are familiar with 7025 will know that sections one to five are general to your lab. Where the lab system kicks in is around six and seven. So six controls your resources for the analysts in terms of their availability, uh, capacity, and competence. It also controls your, if you're using a third party lab to send your sam samples out to, it controls that. Uh, and it controls equipment, equipment calibration and the handling of uh, calibrated items. Section seven is more towards the sample plans, how you set those up, then testing your results, review of results and the rules around that, and crucially, their certificate of conformance and the presentation of that. Finally, section eight is the classic ISO uh, feedback, performance evaluation, and you're using uh, the data on the LIM system to drive that review. 
And that's why it's so important to include the standard as part of the implementation. And this again is another workhorse example. This is where, as we saw, sample manager driving the HACCP program, well here it's driving the instrument calibration program. And again, very visibly, you can see with the in the top uh, left pane, the, the instruments that are outside of calibration, they're marked red. And of course, this standard at its heart is about consistent practice. That's what any standard does, consistent practice, but crucially control. And control has become much more a part of LIMS implementations in recent years. So here, with an instrument that's outside of calibration or maintenance, I can't proceed with the experiment. I'm stopped. So that is a point of control that the system enforces. Similarly, with stocks and reagents in the lab, again, some of these are hazardous substances, so we record their location, but control is uh, applied on the quantity that you use and on the shelf life of the reagent or media. So if the shelf life has been exceeded, you can't proceed and use that media. If you don't have sufficient, you can't proceed. So these are real important controls uh, that, that in, uh, assure compliance. And again, when I'm going in to do my micro testing, I'm assigning samples to incubators and I'm using the system to manage that schedule. Those of you who do micro testing, uh, and if you're still on log books and paper, you'll know the difficulty of moving, of recording what's in particular ovens or incubators that are due uh, to be removed for counting on a particular day. Here you can see the incubation time displayed to you in a browse, so it's more visible. So I'm getting the system, again, to run that program for me. And of course, if I put a result outside the spec, it's going to initiate a corrective action. So you'll see in the bottom right pane there, the incident that's been kicked off, the kappa has been kicked off by this out of spec result. And in the bottom left pane, you can see the two limits I was working to for that particular salmonella test. Yeah, now we're getting getting towards the end and kind of wrapping things up. So I think that the ISO standards, they provide the framework for control and management of um, you know, the systems and it provides that communication between the supplier and the customer. And also, again, it's, it's important for the manufacturer as well. Um, HACCP is, is required, but it is unique to the organization. Um, and the, the approach has to be uh, practical and it has to be what we call evolutionary, where it has to evolve. And then I think the last point is you can, yeah, you can have these systems in place like we've seen, but it's really, you've got to have a safety and quality culture um, element that is the people that are, again, running these systems that are doing the work. So is, there is that, there has to be a safety and, and a quality culture within the organization to make these um, systems really be effective. Yeah, and I'd like to add to that. I, I, I think, you know, in, in the climate we're currently in, we all want to do well for our community, for our customers. Uh, and these standards are a, a very important statement of intent as far as food safety and quality is concerned. It's a statement to your customers uh, and to your organization that we're going to get this right for you. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's very important at the moment. And so the standards in a way are a common language or a communication of that uh, determination. And I, I'm coming back to you know, the application of 17025 or 22,000, and I'm using my own experience both as a consultant implementing and as a owner business manager. I think it's very important that you philosophically make the standard work for you, not you working for the standard. That's the way we started with these standards. These days, we've got to be a lot more pragmatic, as Russell says. And so, you know, you scope what you can do. So if I, if I were doing a lab um, on 17025, I would certainly ensure in the first phase that I've addressed section six of ISO 17025 on resources and section seven on the sample plans. 
I might come back to another phase, a second phase to do instrument integration uh, and the integration of data if I'm sending out some uh, pathogens to a third party lab. And that's the, the standard requires you to validate those interfaces. So I might do those in a second, in a second phase for practical reasons. And again, as Russell said, the second point is really important. Any system uh, will give you uh, most of what you need to assure food safety, but there is or data integrity if you're in a highly regulated industry. But there is that element of, of the human commitment and the human practice that gets you all the way to 100% success. And that's, that depends on organization culture. And that's really important. So establishing a team to do this implementation in-house is very important to establishing that culture as well as bringing the knowledge in that you need. The third point there is to, of course, draw your processes, fully understand your processes, and challenge them. Uh, we, we follow the as is to be mapping process uh, and you get to a, a set of to be flows that's going to drive your food safety management system but you've challenged them in getting to that point. And then the final two points are really implementation and as I said earlier mm -hmm. it's primarily data loading but we provide the standards for organizing that data. Organize the data well and you get great analytics downstream. Yeah. So uh, just to, to wrap on to a couple of final points, today we, we have shown you the importance and the, the, practic the, the practic practical side of standards. So it's almost that you start with the standards you want to achieve and take a practical view. The next important part of what we discussed today are the systems. We focused on LIMS for HACCP. But integrating LIMS to ERP and document management system will give you a full food safety management system, mm -hmm. as well as covering allergens. Um, and as I said, the standard needs to be embedded in the implementation process, not done after it, not done right. separately. Yeah. Uh, one final point I would make uh, in relation to these food safety systems, technology is working in our favor. Since the uh, advent of cloud or the wider use of cloud, the cost to ownership of systems uh, from the hosting side has come down because many organizations don't have a big IT department or, or any at all, and that can now be outsourced. So getting online with a cloud-based uh, food safety system is very practical proposition these days. So if you take that and a practical approach to the implementation, I'm very confident uh, you'll have a very cost-effective solution. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I think we can open it up for questions now. Okay, very good. Well, we have quite a few questions. So, so thank you, Michael and Russell, for a very interesting presentation. And as we get in, as we continue on with the Q and A, please do feel free to submit questions because we do, uh, we will address as many as we can today. All right. So getting started, this question was this question was um, was addressed during your discussion of HACCP in the context of LIMS. So it was towards the beginning of your presentation. What is the difference between ISO 22000 and FSSC 22000 in this context? Michael, I'll let you, the, you're the ISO. Um, I haven't studied FSSC in, in enough detail to comment on that, but uh, I, what I would do is draw uh, the distinction between HACCP and ISO 22000. Um, and the ISO 22000 standard is stronger on leadership, on organization for the solution, uh, and then on measurement uh, of uh, effectiveness. That's really important with any ISO standard, is that you measure the effectiveness not of the preventive measures you've taken, but also of the corrective actions that you uh, apply. You've got to be able to measure the effectiveness of both of those. 
and that that's that would be the main difference for me between HACCP and, and say ISO 22000. Okay, very good. Before we jump into the next question, I do want to mention to our attendees that you will see a quick poll that just appeared on your screen, and it's just some questions from our sponsor regarding information. So that'll be up for the next two minutes or so, and we will still be able to interact with speakers during this time. So the next question, does the software already guide the user to do a HACCP risk assess assessment, or does it quote unquote start when control points are identified? It starts when control points are identified, but it will provide you with the data for the risk assessment. So when you're setting it up for the first year, you're dependent on your knowledge and your fishbone diagrams or logic trees to identify those points. Uh, in the second year, when you're reviewing your program and you're doing your risk assessment, you have data and you're able to look at trends at particular points. So in that sense, in the second year onwards, it's an input to the risk assessment, but the tool for doing the risk assessment is not part of the solution. But you can, in, in Michael, an important point is you're not fixed into like a year or a certain time point. You can add in those, those CCPs. Yeah. You're, you know, either rolling out the system or um, opening up new areas in the plant. So it's, um, it's almost continuous evolving process for, for the configuration and setup. Okay, very good. Here's an interesting question. Do you think we need to review the ISO 22000 standards and other food safety guidelines to suit a post-COVID era, or do you think the same can be executed without any need for change? That's an interesting question. Um, well, I was just a little surprised that the 22,000 standard is, is slow at taking off. Um, that, that's, that's just an observation for me. Uh, I would certainly think it is worthwhile looking, reviewing it in the post-COVID era. Uh, I think there's a lot more you could put in there around uh, personnel practice. I mean, uh, I've used the 22,300 standard uh, for business continuity. Uh, I was actually setting it up for the company when the COVID-19 uh, outbreak happened. And so it was the first thing I had to do was put in a business continuity plan for COVID. Uh, so I found the standard useful there, but I think 22,000 could cover it as well. So, you, you know, you, you could put in uh, review points there on social distancing and mm. sanitation measures. Sanitation, yeah, yeah. Okay, very good. Next question. I work in a small environmental laboratory. We want to incorporate limbs, but we're not sure about the cost availability for small businesses and software companies that offer it, et cetera. Do you have any advice for the implementation process? Yeah, I think cost is always an issue with these systems. And I think what's very important is deciding your key, exactly what you want this system for and sticking to that for your initial phase uh, to control cost. As I said in the presentation, cloud is in your favor because you can outsource those costs in terms of hosting. But for food safety, you know, we're not looking at heavy implementation. It's primarily data loading. Mm. I think you can also look to your internal organization to do some of that. So I would look for a solution that you can data load yourselves if you wish to save that cost. And then, and of course, crucially, maintainability, that you can change and maintain it. So if you want to add more control points during the year, that's something that's within your control that you have very little if no dependency uh, to a vendor on those ones. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good, thank you. Can you please explain how the software supports the different steps of allergen management? 
Well, on allergen management, uh, for the uh, we'll just take the plant monitoring for monitoring for cross contamination. We we set that up similar to a HACCP program for uh, the materials themselves, ingredients that come in that may have allergens in them. You're probably going to re be recording those on your ERP system, yeah. so you've got an integration point there. Uh, and you need to record where you're storing that product, uh, either on the ERP or the limbs. And you then need to have, and we can do this on limbs if, if it's not done at the ERP level, you need procedures for the handling of that uh, product. And uh, we can run that on the LES that I explained. So I think with, with uh, allergens, there's a definite integration with the ERP. And finally, of course, the label, the label issue the label for the product are going to come from the ERP. Then also you've got the suppliers because yeah. you're going to have a, a supplier supplier list and you're going to identify those um, suppliers that have allergens in, in their plant. So it's that's an additional point on that. Okay, and while we're on the topic of allergens, I, this may kind of bridge into your previous mm -hmm. answer. Uh, can we classify allergens as chemical hazards? And if not, how should they be classified? And if under a chem chemical, can an auditor pick it as a non-conformant? Hmm. I, I, I certainly, in my limbs experience, have classified it as a chemical hazard. Um, and it can, it, it can drive a non-conformance because you can record the material or material type with the non-conformance. Hmm. Yeah, okay, I think you could, go, you could go either way on that. So I think I think internally, Michael and I are still uh, debating and discussing that. But you could go you could go either way, I, from my standpoint. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, next question: Is there a mechanism used to ensure that data points are an accurate representation of what they are monitoring? I think that is that's a good question. Uh, that comes down to your your risk assessment. Uh, have you correctly identified those points in the first instance? And if, for example, your monitoring is showing very little uh, risk of you know if you run a, a program for a year or two, and particular points show really no risk in terms of the the data that you're looking at of a contamination then you'd have to question, why did you risk assess it in the first place? Right. So you're really going to use live data to validate that particular question. Okay, great, thank you. Next question, we currently use a heavily customized limb. What would be the process for us to move to sample manager? I, well, I, I think the process would be to consider uh, a HACCP program, even even coexisting with your existing limbs, we, we could set that up just as a distinct HACCP program with the sample points uh, and, and you know get get that program working effectively and, and get that program working as your phase one. And then for your phase two, you can consider bringing over your quality control onto that platform. Yeah, what, let me jump in here is the other thing is if you did start with a, a new set of requirements i'd recommend using astm is just downloading the astm guide and it's got all of the requirements you'd probably ever need built in so that way instead of spending time saying well what are the requirements for a new system just use what astm has that's um that will save you a lot of time because they've already they've already done it Yeah, and I I I uh, I endorse that, um, and I know we often give our clients uh, template URS documents, user requirement specs, uh, pretty much driven uh, written agnostically. Mm -hmm. But I think I think getting the requirements right uh, and realistically right is so important. Um, I consider that and the management, the overall management 
of the solution. The project management has been key to success. Okay. How is safety-related important data captured in LIMS for compliance related to food safety testing techniques and or equipment? If I've understood that right, um, I just start at the end there. Testing techniques. That that's interesting because we were actually going to include something on that, uh, but we felt we too much. So we we we're we're very passionate about methodology and uh, testing techniques are really important. Mm. Um, one of the areas I was studying was, uh, for example, Chronobacter in uh, dairy uh, protein or infant milk formula. And uh, so I was looking at a method for that using the LES that I described in the presentation. And of course, it turned out that Chronobacter in infant milk formula is a relation related to COVID-19. Uh, um, but the, the LES, and then I found that Thermo actually had uh, some uh, processes, standardized uh, methods for that using the uh, PCR test unit that you hear a lot about these days. But you'll also find particular, I'd be used to the European standards, you'll also find particular standards for executing those methods, European standards for executing those methods. And you'll find FDA have standards as well for executing them, as well as Codex Elementarius. Yeah, and in most limbs today, they, they've got some sort of workflow functionality built in. So we had uh, we had situations for certain countries, additional water tests were required or separate specifications. So we were able to within the workflow engine say, okay, if, if the if the water's coming from uh, let's say Japan, we require these additional tests like radionuclides to be performed on those. So you can you can it's easy to build that logic into um, have the actual business rules drive the testing that gets assigned, um, you know, for the samples. Okay. How much human intervention is there in feeding the data? If you need false data, do you get false results? And is there data in integrity embedded into the limbs? It's a three part. If you need me to read it, I'm happy to read it again. No, I'll take it. It's uh, it's fundamental to it, yeah. uh, including the data integrity. Um, so for the 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 critical control points or the analyses that you're setting up, you need we describe that as master data. You need a documented master data procedure for that. We have tools to upload that data, but yeah. the procedure will will call out. The review points so that you review the data before it's loaded you load it in a development environment uh, or a val and then you move it into validation and you can test it before you go live you also risk assess the data which is crucial to data integrity because some data will have a more dramatic effect if it's wrong than other data and so that data requires validation some data is is less uh, impactful and so you know you can you can you can have a shorter uh, verification procedure with that data so uh, data integrity goes to the heart of everything here um, but we have the tools to upload them but you need the processes to go with that and that, that's a lot of what we do in an implementation Maria what was the second part of that question it was around a retest or um, I'll, I'm going to I'm going to read the whole thing just so you have the context. Okay. How much human inter and human intervention is there in feeding the data? If you feed false data, do you get false results? Is there data integrity embedded into limbs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like anything bad bad data in, bad data out. I yeah. I was just thinking we had debates all the time. Is if you if you have a out of spec result does it require a retest likewise you could have a a result that's in spec and does that require retest yeah. how do you know so it's but you can build all of that sort of logic in well, yeah just just to come in on that point i mean what i refer to was 
mostly the static data, but in the use of the system, the dynamic data, you're under any rule of data integrity, you must identify critical data points, like a result you're saying, Russell, yes. that's a critical data point, and that mandates review. So you've got to review it, whether it's in spec or not. Yeah, but also if, you, if your instruments are connected to the limbs, then there's that layer that it wasn't the human reeking of data that caused it. You can at least know it came from the instrument and you should have your control charts and your everything. Yeah. And the, you know, the limbs should control that the instrument was calibrated and, and properly maintained. Yeah. Or it, so it's not an instrument issue. It's not a stock issue. You're kind of zoning in on a, maybe it's a genuine out of spec because there's a yep. problem with the product, or somewhere there's been an error. Yeah. Very good. I really liked the dashboards that give an instant view of production health. Is it possible to restrict the view of dashboards to a limited group of people? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. And again, this is back to data. You know, with these systems, we're over the functional feast. They, uh, they have the functionality you need. So the, the effort is really on organizing the data and partitioning the data. So you've got roles in, in, in this system. And so by role, you can have view of particular data that somebody else uh, won't see. They might see the same sample, but you can stop them seeing certain aspects of the data on that sample. Yeah. Okay, great. How big of an issue are airborne contaminants in the primary production areas as opposed to the lab and clean room areas? Hmm. I think they're high. They're certainly higher than than those two. That'd be my opinion. Yeah, I'm not familiar enough to answer that, but we can get back to you. Okay, very good. Now, the examples you've shown represent samples that were taken with known sample points. However, how do you handle vector samples that are driven by a kappa? They no longer apply to the original sample point as a swab is not part of the plan. How are those samples represented and then applied to the dashboard? So you can take a, uh, you could take a, a resample uh, to link the two together. Uh, that's one way of doing it. Or that would be my way of doing it, just to create that link between the vector sample and the original uh, contamination sample. Mm. Yeah, you're you're not forced to. One particular, you can have all different sample types that are that are would be part of that. So you're not, it doesn't tie you to just to a certain, you know, sample yeah. type of sample or. And another aspect to it would be using the kappa or the incident and yeah. linking the original sample and the vector sample to that. Hmm. Okay, very good. What are some things that businesses can do to help create the safety culture, as mentioned, besides implementing ISO and HACCP systems? It, I think it has to come from senior management. Uh, that's where it has to start from. And then there's a lot of there's a lot of good books. Um, sh I mean, short books. They're like maybe 50 or 60 pages that um, you can buy and quite cheap on Amazon and distribute those to the organization. But it I think it just has to be part of the um part of the culture. And when we implemented this at um the comp pre my previous company, um we would start every meeting with a quality minute and somebody would talk about a safety or quality issue, but it was just um management said we're gonna bring this into our daily discussions, our meetings. So, you know, I think there's a lot of um, probably organizational examples of be best practices that you could find on, on the web or from our experience. So, and it doesn't cost a lot of money. You don't have to pay that, you know, lots of money. You can do simple things. Yeah, like again, maybe I speak from my own experience of managing a company with uh, 
ISO 9001. And again, I, you know, the question is predicated on not having the standard, but from experience, getting the culture right precedes the system. Once the culture is right, you've got the best input to how that system should work uh, and you're not battling. And uh, so getting that right at the start or in advance of a system is really important. And uh, as Russell said, we in our oper in our business, we've, uh, we've, because we're working remotely these days, we have a weekly operations meeting um, and quality is always in there. Um, mm -hmm. Not just looking at schedules, we look at CIAs or any incidents, and uh, when when you've got that culture, then the, the rest I think follows much more easily. Yeah. And I want to just get to one other question that's you know sort of in that whole culture area. What role, if any, do maintenance teams, for example, technicians, supervisors, and planners, have in supporting food safety and quality in regards to ISO and HACCP? They're involved because they're they're involved in the plant cleaning and plant maintenance. Plant uh, maintenance yeah. yeah, so they're uh, they they have to be on that team. Okay, very good. And it looks like we have one more question here. Our lab is looking for ISO seventeen o twenty five compliance. Can LIMS help us meet those requirements? Absolutely, uh, and as I said in the presentation, the limbs should be implemented around the, the, the standard. Uh, so you call out that standard in your project objectives, you identify the features in limbs that can meet that standard, and that standard will give you good guidance then as you do the implementation. So functionally, it'll meet, it'll meet the standard but you need to include it in your requirements and your implementation plan. Make sure that you have those uh, sections, from my point of view, sections uh, six and seven thoroughly covered. Seven is huge as far as reporting of results and so on. So you pick in there what's relevant to your business. And then you also, if you want to uh, bring this into the management system of your lab or the company, then you provide data for performance evaluation and the management review meeting. Again, that's a key ISO requirement is you have your annual review meeting. In fact, you can have it more than once a year, but you have these review meetings and you've got to call out the parameters that you're looking to judge you know, your performance on quality. Yeah, we, we implemented 17025 and certain locations, it was funny that auditors would come in and the first thing they'd ask for is some representative C of A's that were gen generated from the system, and they would start with that, and then from there go into the into the lab. So it was wasn't looking at the reports at the end; it was looking at the beginning and going from there. Yeah, if I were doing an audit, I would start with the certificate of analysis, yeah. pick a result, and go right walk walk back through the procedure yeah. for that yeah. result in its history. Yeah, and they, they would. They'd pick out, out of spec results and yeah. again conforming results and say, show me that this really is conforming or you know, the out of spec. Okay, very good. So it looks like we got through all of our questions. So Michael and Russell, would or do you have any closing comments that you'd like to make before I wrap things up, starting with Michael and then followed by Russell? Well, just to thank everybody for attending today. I've been looking at the monitors, a very high number of you stayed with the talk. I hope you found it useful. Please feel free to contact us uh, on any of the issues we discussed today, or if we can advise you in any way, we'd be delighted to do so. Uh, both Russell and I are pretty passionate on this subject mm -hmm. and we're learning all the time, and we're very happy to share our experiences. Yeah, just to echo that. Yeah, thank thank you for taking the time out to to join, and more importantly, to stay stay on the call um, through the presentation. But this is our our first one, so that's what we were talking before the meeting. It's, it's one of those things you can always you can always go back and say oh, we should have done that, we should have done this. But I think the more of these that we do or work on, uh, certainly I think they'll be better, smoother. But now we have a with the questions that were asked. I think that can be baked into the next uh, webinar that we have scheduled. 
Okay, very good. Well, thanks again to Michael and Russell for being our subject matter experts today. And, and thanks for the thorough answering of, of all those questions, because we really put you on the spot there with the Q&A. And it was great, um, your participation there. I'd also like to thank our sponsor, Thermo Scientific, for sponsoring this event today. And just a reminder to folks that we will be holding a food lab conference the first week of June and registration is complimentary. So we do encourage you to attend that event. It will be Tuesday through Friday, June 2nd through 5th. And we also invite you to check out our website, foodsafetytech.com, where you'll see um, the latest news in the industry. And we also have a section that will have the events and webinars that we do run future and we do have the past recordings that will be available once again just a reminder the handout is available on the organizer pane that you see to your right and also you will receive a recording of this event so once again i'd like to thank our speakers our sponsor and thank you to all of our attendees stay well stay healthy stay safe and we will sure, be sure to see everybody virtually very soon Take care, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Great.